Very pretty young woman crossing the street. And I think she may be coming here. Incidentally, I have glanced over your latest account of my work. Oh, yes. Honestly, I cannot congratulate you upon it. Detection is or ought to be an exact science. Observation, deduction, a cold, unemotional subject. You have attempted to tinge it with romanticism, which has much the same effect as if you'd worked a love story or an elopement into the fifth proposition of Euclid. Who can that? There's a young lady to see you, Mr. Holmes. It's Mary Morstan. I have no recollection of the name. You Don't go, Doctor. I may need you. I was right. Miss Morstan. Good afternoon. I've come to you, Mr. Holmes, because you once enabled my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester, to um, unravel a minor domestic complication. She was much impressed with your kindness and skill. Thank you. I can hardly imagine anything more strange, more utterly inexplicable than the situation in which I find myself. State your case. Uh, you will, I'm sure, excuse me. If your friend would be good enough to remain, he might be of inestimable service to me. Of course. Briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in an Indian regiment. My mother died when I was still quite a child, and, and he was forced to send me home, despite the fact that I had no relatives here. I was placed in a comfortable boarding establishment at Edinburgh, and I remained there until I was 17 years of age. In that same year, my father who was a senior captain of his regiment, obtained um, 12 months' leave and returned home. He telegraphed to me from London to say that he'd arrived all safe and directed me to come down at once, giving the Langham Hotel as his address. His message, as I remember, was full of love and kindness. On reaching London, I, I drove straight to the Langham Hotel and was informed that Captain Morstan was staying there, but that he'd gone out the night before and, and had not returned. So I waited. All day. Without news of him. And that night, on the advice of the manager of the hotel, I communicated with the police. The next day, we advertised in all the newspapers. Our inquiries led to no result. From that day to this, no word has ever been heard of my unfortunate father. <sighs> yeah. 
He came home with his heart so full of hope to find some peace, some comfort, and instead. The date? The 3rd of December, exactly 10 years ago. His luggage? Remained at the hotel. Oh, there was nothing in it to suggest a clue, some clothes, some books, and a considerable number of curiosities from the Andaman Islands. My father had been one of the officers in charge of the convict guard there. Watson, this place is a mess. Had any friends in town? Only one that we know of. Major Sholto of his own regiment. The 34th Bombay Infantry. We communicated with the Major, of course, but... he did not seem to know that his brother officer was in England. It's a singular case. I have not yet communicated to you the most singular part. Four years later, an advertisement appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan and stating that it would be to her advantage to come forward. There was no name appended. I had, at the time, just entered the family of Mrs. Cecil Forrester in the capacity of governess, and on her advice, I published my address in the advertisement column. That same day, there appeared, through the post, a small cardboard box addressed to me, which I found to contain a very large, lustrous pearl. No word of writing was enclosed. And since then, every year, upon the same date, there has always appeared a similar box containing a similar pearl, with no clue as to the sender. They have been pronounced by an expert to be of a rare variety and of, of considerable value. You can see for yourself that they are very handsome. Your case is most interesting. Something else has occurred to you. Yes, and no later than today. That is why I have come to you. This letter arrived through the post this morning which you will perhaps read for yourself. Envelope, please. Oh. London Postmark, October 7. Man's thumb mark on corner. Probably postman. Best quality paper. Sixpence a packet. Particular man in his stationery. Watson. Be at the third pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at 7 o'clock. If you're distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring the police. If you do, all will be in vain. Your unknown friend. Well, really, this is a very pretty little problem. What do you intend to do, Miss Molston? Well, that is exactly what I want to ask you. Why, well, then you and I shall go together. What? Dr. Watson is the very man. Your correspondent says two friends. But would he come? I should be proud and happy if I can be of any service. Oh, you're both very kind. I've led a retired life and have no friends whom I could appeal to. If I'm here at six, it will do, I suppose. Yes, but you must not be later. Goodbye, Miss Morse. Goodbye, Mr. Holmes. Au revoir. Au revoir. What a very attractive woman. It is of the first importance not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. A client to me is a mere unit, a factor of the problem. Holmes, you're an automaton, a calculating machine. There's something positively inhuman in you at times. I assure you, the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And the most repellent man of my acquaintance 
is a philanthropist who has spent nearly a quarter of a million upon the London poor. However, in this case... Oh. I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. I'm going out. I'll see you in an hour. Had he any friends in town? Uh, only one uh, that we know of. Major Sholto of his own regiment. There's no great mystery in this matter. The facts appear to admit only one explanation. Are you solved it already? I found on consulting the back files of the Times that Major Sholto of Upper Norwood, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry, died just six years ago. Mrs. Hudson, you're dreadfully underfoot. <coughs> I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see what this suggests. Really? You surprise me. Then look at it this way, then. Captain Morstan disappears. The only person in London whom he could have visited is Major Sholto. Major Sholto denies having heard that he was even in London. Four years later, Sholto dies. Within a week of his death, Captain Morstan's daughter receives a valuable present, which is repeated from year to year, and now culminates in a letter which describes her as a wronged woman. Now, what wrong can it possibly refer to except this deprivation of her father? Take pleasure. Go. And why should these presents begin immediately after Shelter's death, unless it is that Shelter's heir knows something of the mystery and desires to make compensation? Are you ready, Watson? And waiting. Have you any alternative theory that will meet the facts? What strange compensation and how strange you make! What time is it? It's a little past the hour. Evening, Robert. Evening, Miss Up. Why should somebody write her a letter now rather than six years ago? Again, the letter speaks of giving her justice. What justice can she have? It is too much to suppose that her father is still alive and there is no other injustice in her case that you know of. There are difficulties, but there are always difficulties. Good evening, Mr. Holmes. I do hope I'm not Good late. evening. By the way, a, a curious paper was found in Papa's desk, which nobody could understand. I don't suppose it is of the slightest importance, but I, I thought you might like to see it, so I brought it with me. The paper appears to be of Indian manufacture. At some point, it has been pinned to a ball. The diagram upon it appears to be the plan, part of a large building, with numerous halls, corridors, and passages. There's a cross in red ink. And beside it is written 3.37 from left. There is a curious hieroglyphic, a sign of four. Carter Singh, Indigit Singh, Jagadish Singh, Jonathan Small. The paper has been kept carefully in a pocketbook. The one side is as clean as the other. It was in his pocketbook that we found it. Preserve it carefully, Miss Morstan. I begin to suspect that this case may be much deeper and more subtle than I had at first supposed. Miss Morstan? I am Miss Morstan, and these two gentlemen are my companions. I must ask you to 
give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. I give you my word. Servant, Miss Morstan. Your servant, uh, gentlemen. <laughs> C come in, come in, come in, come in to, to my uh, my little sanctum. <laughs> I, I, I trust you have uh, no objection to uh, uh, tobacco smoke, uh, the balsamic odor of Eastern tobacco. <laughs> I am uh, a little nervous, and I I find my hookah to be. <laughs> An invaluable. <laughs> Sedative. You will excuse me, Mr. Sholto, but I am here at your request to learn something which you desire to tell me. It is getting very late, and I should wish the interview to be as short as possible. It must take some time. For we have to go to Norwood to see Brother Bartholomew. We must all see... if we can get the better of... Brother Bartholomew. He is angry with me for taking the course that has seemed right to me. You cannot imagine what a terrible fellow he is when he is angry. If we are to go to Norwood, it would perhaps be as well if we were to start at once. No. No, that would hardly do. I don't know what he would say if we came upon him in that sudden way. No, I, I must prepare you by showing you where we all stand. Hmm? Hmm? To, 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 to each other. I must uh, lay the facts before you, as I know them myself. My father, the late Major John Shorto, came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Norwood some 11 years ago. He had prospered in India and brought back with him a considerable sum of money, a collection of valuable curiosities, and a staff of native servants. With these advantages, uh, he lived in great luxury. My brother and I were at university at the time. We did know, however, that, that some mystery, some positive danger overhung our father. He was very fearful of going out alone, and he employed two prize fighters uh, to guard him. Uh, Williams, who drove you here tonight, uh, was one of them. For some reason, he never told anyone. My father had a marked aversion to men with wooden legs. <laughs> On one occasion, he actually fired his revolver at a one-legged man. A harmless tradesman, as it turned out. Oh, yes, I, 
Well, remember, we had to pay a considerable sum to hush it up. And then, suddenly, my father received a letter. That was obviously a great shock to him. informed us there was no hope and that he wished to make a last communication to us. My dear son. When, when we were in India, my friend, Boston and I came into possession of a, a considerable treasure. I brought it home with me to this house, where it still lies. On the day that Morstan arrived home from the east, he came straight to this house to claim his share. We gave our word, Sholto. A promise! We give our word and our oath. A family man. Another life. Another world. A solemn promise. If you try to betray me, Morstan, if you dare to cross me, oh. I'm... Oh. My God! The man is dead, thou Chandra. You have nothing to fear, sir. I will arrange everything. And so it was done, Miss Marston, in secrecy, of course, but with respect. This is disgraceful, Mr. Shelton. Your father's behavior was quite unforgivable. Please, Doctor. I knew in my heart that he was dead. My father was not a well man. I'm only glad he did not suffer. You're very brave, Miss Morstan. What concerns me now is the reason for this quarrel. I cannot imagine how my father came to be involved with that treasure. I'm afraid that, that is not clear to, to me, Miss Morstan. I can only tell you my father's instructions concerning it. My, my Even those levels were constant. poor. Morstan's often. The, the, the greed, the cursed greed that has been my besetting sin throughout my life has, has robbed her of the treasure. Half of which, at least, should be hers. You see that chaplet there? the cleaning but I had the design of, of sending it to her but I could not bear to part with them you my sons will see that Miss Morstan gets her share of the treasure hmm? Get him away! For 
climbed to the window and out into the garden, but the intruder was gone. My father was dead. We soon had more striking proof that there were secret agencies at work all around us. The next day, my father's bedroom was broken into, and this was fixed to his chest. Remarkable. It is the Sikh symbol for the numero four. What the paper means and who our secret visitor or visitors were, we, we never found out. My, my brother and I were much excited, as you can imagine, of the treasure my father had spoken, but try as we might, we couldn't find it. It was maddening to think that the hiding place was on his very lips when he, uh, when he died. We could uh, judge the splendor of the riches by the chaplet that he had taken out. The pearls were evidently of great value, and uh, my brother was um, averse to part with them um, for between friends, he was a little inclined to my father's fault. And it was all I could do was to persuade him to allow me to send Miss Morstan a detached pearl at regular intervals so that she would not feel destitute. It was a kindly thought. Oh. It was very good of you. Oh, well, we were your trustees. That was the way I looked at it, although my brother did not altogether see it in that light. We had plenty of money ourselves. It would have been in uh, such bad taste to have treated a young lady in so scurvy a fashion. Yesterday, an event of extreme importance occurred. We found the treasure. Hence my instant communication to you, Miss Marston. Now all we have to do is to drive to Norwood and claim our share. We shall be uh, expected, if not entirely welcome, uh, visitors. Uh, you have done well, from first to last, Mr. Shelton. Uh, uh, my health is uh, somewhat fragile. I am compelled to be a, a valetudinarian. <laughs> we dug up every inch of the garden without discovering anything. Brother Bartholomew is such a clever fellow. Do you know how he found out where the treasure was? Tell me. <laughs> he made measurements everywhere, all along the top, along the side, inside, and he found out he was four foot out at the top. We found our father had made a false room, and, and <laughs> so he smashed through the, the lath and the plaster, and, and there was the, the treasure chest lying across the the rafters. <laughs> he has computed the value of the treasure to be more than one half million sterling. <laughs> Mrs. Burnstone. Mrs. Burnstone's the only lady in the house. Um, wait here. in England have been let loose in it. There's something amiss with Bartholomew. Into the house! I, I, my nerves won't stand. Oh, bless you, sweet God, Oh, but I've been 
sorely tried this day. Hi, Mrs. Bernstein. Mr. Bartholomew shut himself in his room and I can't get a word out of him. His bed hasn't been slept in and he hasn't been down for any food. I dare not disturb him at his work. You know what he's like when it's at his work. Look after him, Miss Morstan. <laughs> Now, do try to calm down. Look, I'm sure everything will be all right. I do hope you're all right, miss. Sit down, Andy. <laughs> Come on. Which is the door? Something devilish in this one. Murder. We, we brought the treasure down there last night. I mean, I, can we put it there? No, it's gone. What time is that? Hmm? I don't know. Six or, or seven o'clock. I, I heard him lock the door after, after I left. It must have been the last person to, to, to see him alive. And now he's dead. <laughs> Don't think I did it. Don't think it was me. I, I wouldn't. Why should I wouldn't have asked you? Why should I? I, 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 I'm the man. Now, I know. I'm gently, the man. gently, 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 uh, gently, uh, Mr. Sheldon. I suggest that you go down to the police station and tell them everything that you know. We shall wait here until you return. Holmes. Look at this. Careful. Forgive me, it's poison. Huh. Well, Watson, we have a little time. Let's make the most of it. Oh, this is an insoluble mystery to me. It grows darker instead of clearer. No, 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 no. It clears every instant. I only required a few missing links to have an entirely connected case. Simple as the case seems now, there may be something deeper underlying it. Now, how did these people come and how did they go? People? Well, it takes more than one, perhaps more than two, to remove a heavy treasure chest from a place like this. The door has not been opened since last night. So how about these windows? Snibbed on the inside. No hinges, that Roof quite out of reach, no drain pipe near. And yet someone has entered this way. Look, Watson. Is that scuff on the sill? This and this. This is a very pretty demonstration. Yes, but that that's not a footmark. Something much more valuable to us. This is the mark of a boot. And this and this the mark of the timber toe. He's just a wooden-legged man. And someone else. A very able and efficient ally. Could you scale that wall, Watson? <laughs> Absolutely impossible. Unaided, it is so. But suppose you had a friend who lowered you this. 
good stout rope, securing it first to this ring. I think if you were an active man, you'd be able to swarm up, wooden leg and all. You would depart, of course, in the same fashion, and then your friend would pull up the rope, close the window, snip it on the inside, and depart in the manner he originally came. Well, the thing grows more unintelligible than ever. How about this mysterious ally? How did he get into the room? Yes, this ally. He lifts this case from the regions of the commonplace. Well, the door is locked, the window inaccessible. The grate's too small. How, then? You will not follow my precept. How often have I said to you that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. to come in through the roof. Excellent, Watson. Hold this lamp. Let us carry our research to the room above. The secret room in which the treasure was found. A skylight. Holmes, a child has done this horrid thing. My memory failed me, or I should have been able to foretell it. We'll learn what we can from here. Let us go down. What is your theory about those footmarks? My dear Watson, try a little analysis yourself. You know my methods. Apply them. I cannot conceive of anything that will cover the facts. You will soon. We're in luck. Our little ally has trod in the creosote. Oh, oh you fond of animals, I see. Yes, very good. <laughs> Lovely fun. Well, well, well. Well, quite a nice little place you've got here. Indeed. Uh, oh! That is the accredited representatives of the law, unless I'm very, very much mistaken. Now, Watson. Before they come, what do you make of this poor fellow? The muscles are as stiff as a board. A state of extreme contraction. Far exceeding the usual rigor mortis. Quite so. Coupled with this distortion of the face, the Hippocratic smile. Rhesus sadonicus, as the old writers call it. What would that suggest to your mind? Death from a powerful vegetable alkaloid, some strychnine-like substance that produces tetanus. To the right. Come along, gentlemen, to the right. Up these stairs. This thorn. Not an English thorn. I think it is not right that Miss Morstan remain in this stricken house. I suggest you slip away and take her home, Watson, and then go on to Three Pension Lane. Lambeth and asked for Toby. Three pinch in lane. I'd rather have Toby's health than that of the whole protective force of London. Well, here's a pretty business. <laughs> Place is as full as a rabbit warren. I think you may recollect me. Mr. Thelney Jones. Why? Oh, of course I do. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. I'll never forget the way you lectured us all about the Bishopgate jewel case. True, you set us on the right track then, but I think you'll own now it was more by good luck than good guidance. It was a piece of very simple reasoning. Oh, come now, come. Never be ashamed to own up. But, uh... What is all this? It's a bad business. Bad business. 
stern facts here. No room for theories. It's lucky I happened to be up at Norwood on another case when I got the message. How do you think this man died? No, this is not a case for me to theorize over. No, no. Still, we can't deny. You hit the nail on the head sometimes. Door locked, I understand. Uh, jewels worth a fortune missing. How were the windows? Fastened, but there was a footstep on the sill. Windows fastened, nothing to do with it. It's common sense. Man could have died in a fit, I suppose. Ah, I have a theory. These flashes come to me sometimes. Sergeant, outside of you, please. And you too, Mr. Shotto. What do you think of this, Holmes? Shotto has confessed he was with his brother last night. Brother dies in a fit. Shotto walks off with the treasure. How about that? Whereupon the dead man very considerately gets up and locks the door from the inside. Aye. Aye. There's a flaw there somewhere. Let us apply common sense to the matter. They were brothers. There was a quarrel. Brother Bartholomew, dead. Jewels, gone. And Master Thaddeus, evidently in a disturbed state of mind. His appearance, oh, well, not attractive. You see, I'm weaving a web. Around Thaddeus, the net begins to close upon him. Jones, that splinter, which I firmly believe to be poisoned, that card and that curiously shaped instrument were lying there on the table. Confirms my theory in every respect. The house is full of Indian curiosities. All points to Thaddeus. But how did he escape? There is a trap door in the roof, Sergeant. Pray ask Mr. Sholto to step this way. You see, facts are better than theories, after all. My view of the case is confirmed. There is a trapdoor communicating with the roof, and it is partly open. It was I who opened it. Mr. Thaddeus Shoto, mm. it is my duty to inform you that anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence against you. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. Didn't I tell you no, that? No, don't trouble yourself, Mr. Shotter. I think I can engage to clear you of this charge. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theorist. You may find it a harder matter than you think. Not only will I clear, Mr. Sholto, but I will give you a description of the two men who were in this room last night. One was a poorly educated man, strong, active, with his right leg off, wearing a stump worn away on the inner side. His left boot has a coarse, square-toed sole. He has an iron band around the heel. He is much sunburned, middle-aged, and has a certain amount of skin missing from the palm of one hand. And the other one? He is rather a curious person. I hope before long to be able to introduce you to the pair of them. Watson. Go to three Pinchin Lane, Lambeth, and ask for Toby. I'd rather have Toby's help than that of the whole detective force of London.
Toby. Mr. Toby. Get out of it! You drunken hooligan. Go on, get out of it. Or I'll turn my dogs on you, all 43 of them. I'm looking for Mr. Toby. Oh, I've got a wiper in this bag and I'll tip it out over your head if you don't hook it. It's urgent that I find him. I won't be arguing with. One, two, three, and down Mr. comes your Sherlock wiper. Holmes. I've come for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, well, who'd have thought it? Oh, there you are, Cotty. Ah, ah, yeah. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, why didn't you say so? Come in. Oh, uh, no, my dear, my dear, because he bites something vicious. Oh, yes, he does, now, naughty. Naughty, don't you bite the gentleman? Because this gentleman is a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and any friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes is a friend of mine. <laughs> I don't mind him. He'll just give you a nice, friendly squeeze. I'll give him the run of the room because he keeps down the Beatles, something beautiful. Now, what did you say Mr. Sherlock wanted? Toby. Toby? Yes, Toby. Oh, well, Toby's number seven there, along on the left. Here, you give him these, and Toby will go along with you as quiet as a lamb. Hey, Toby, wake up. Come on. There's work for you to do. A gentleman come here to see you. Toby, come on. That's He's a good done, mate. Come on, Toby. Laugh sometimes, just Toby. Come on, Toby. Come on. Come on out, sir. Watson! It's all right, officer. It's Mr. Holmes. Coachman. Come on, Toby. You've got Toby. Come on. Oh, that's a good Here comes Blondin. I'm coming down. Watson. I found them in the gutter. Ah, oh, thank you, Mrs. Bernstone. Do you smell the creosote? Othelda Jones arrested not only Thaddeus, but the gamekeeper, the gatekeeper, and two of the Indian servants. I was lucky to escape myself. What hellish thing? Watson, are you on for a bit of a trudge? Of course. <laughs> You and Toby, game as they come when there's a good holding scent. Now, find him. Go, Toby. Spend. Seek, Toby. Seek. Go seek him. Spend it, Watson. Spend it. Lucky the rain has stopped. <laughs> the scent will lie on the road in spite of their start. Ah, how sweet the morning air is. Have you brought your pistol, Watson? No, I have my stick. You may need it if we get to the land. Now, listen, Pegleg, I'll leave to you. Be the ally to me. Come. No 
Well, what the deuce is the matter with the dog? They took a boat. They certainly didn't take a cab or a balloon. They must have been met at the water's edge. Toby! 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 He's lost his character for infallibility. No, 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 Toby's not to blame. Those barrels are filled with creosote. The scent is divided. So like good huntsman Watson, we must cast the dog again and find the true one. Toby! Toby! Out of luck. They've taken a boat from here. <sighs> these people are clever than I thought. Now, Watson, these people show preconcerted management here. Mordecai Smith. You come back here and have your face washed. Jack! Oh, you damn him. I'll, I'll get your dad to give you a proper item when he gets back. <laughs> Why, what a crazy cheeked young rascal. Is there anything you'd like, Jack? I'd like a shilling. <laughs> Fine young lad you've got there, Mrs. Smith. Lord bless you, sir, he is that. And forward. <laughs> he gets almost too much for me to manage, especially when my man is away days at a time. Ah, it's a pity about that. I was hoping to hire a boat from him, a steam launch. Oh, bless you, sir, it isn't the steam launch that he has gone. Ah, I didn't like the bloke who did the eye, not at all. Very rough, with a wooden leg. Come tapping at our window in the middle of the night, and away they went without a word to me. Now, this man with the wooden leg, was he alone? Seemed he might have had an animal with him. Uh, a dog? Didn't look like no dog to me, sir. More like something you find in the zoo. It's a pity about the launch. It's the old green bird with the yellow line. Oh, no, no, sir, no. The aurora's just been fresh painted. Black with gold trim. Ah, oh, yes, of course. With a white funnel. No, sir, black funnel. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Well, thank you, Mrs. Smith. Goodbye, Jack. Boy! The main thing with people of that sort is never to let them think their information is of the slightest importance to you. If you do, they will instantly shut up like an oyster. Well, our course seems pretty clear now. What would you do then? Well, get on the track of the Aurora. It would take days, if not months, to search every wharf and landing place and yard between here and Greenwich. What do you propose? As our quarry has no reason to fear that he's being hunted, I propose, first of all, a bath and shave, and then a good meal, and then some hours of sleep. At the same time, mobilizing the Baker Street division of the detective police force. <laughs> In other words, the irregulars. <laughs> oh, the energetic Jones and the ubiquitous reporter have fixed up the case between them. Watson, look at this. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Mr. Jones is trained and experienced faculties, but once directed towards the detection of the criminals. <laughs> His well known technical knowledge and powers of minute observation. <laughs> well, it gets better still. <laughs> the prompt and energetic action of the officers of the law shows the great advantage of a single 
vigorous, and masterful mind. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous? We had a close shave and be arrested ourselves. I wouldn't answer for our safety now if he has another of his attacks of energy. Good heavens, Stay there! Sorry, I think I have Mr. nothing of this. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. They are my guests. Look, that's all. I got your message. I bought them up sharp. Three bob and a tanner for the tickets. Now, Wiggins, in future, they can report to you and you to me. I cannot have the house invaded in this way. Oi, stop that. Hey. Now, I want you to find the steamboat Aurora. Aurora? Owner, Mordecai Smith. Black with gold trim. Richmond to Gravesend, both sides of the river. Right, sir. How much? Old scale of pay. A guinea to the boy who finds the boat. <sighs> Here is a day in advance. If the launch is above water, the Irregulars will find her. They can go everywhere, see everything. <laughs> if our man had an easy task, this of ours ought to be. Wooden leg men are not so common, and this other man must be unique. The Aborigines of the Andaman Islands may perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon this earth. They are a fierce, morose, and intractable people. They're capable of forming the most devoted friendships when their confidence has once been gained. They have always been a terror to shipwrecked crews. Draining the survivors with their stone-headed clubs or shooting them with... with poisoned arrows. These massacres are usually concluded by a cannibal feast. Nice, amiable people. yourself out, old man. I heard you marching about all night. You really must get some rest. I can't sleep. This infernal problem is consuming me. No news? None. None whatsoever. The whole river's been searched on both sides. Mrs. Smith's not heard from her husband. It's too much. To be balked by so petty an obstacle when all else has been overcome. Right. 
for a nice little cry. Aye. She's a good boat, this. We built her here in this yard. Fastest boat on the river. What's she in for? Repairs to a rudder. That's the order. I can't find anything amiss with it. I want her in the water by six o'clock tonight. Fully cold and steam up. Right, Mr. Smith, she'll be ready. Six o'clock sharp, mind. For I've two gentlemen that'll not be kept waiting. Right. It's this Norwood case, Doctor. I have a great deal to worry and try me. And this case is a very dark one, too. Thank you. I should be most grateful for Mr. Holmes' help. Your friend is a wonderful man and not to be beat. Well, you may be in for a long wait. No, I don't think so. Go to Baker Street at once. If I have not returned, wait for me. I am close on the track of the Sholto gang. Come with us tonight if you want to be in at the kill. Good. So he's on the scent again. <laughs> he's been at fault too, has he? Huh? Even the best of us are thrown off sometimes. <laughs> oh? <laughs> yes, Sherlock Holmes. What is it? Are you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? No, but I'm acting for him. I've come about this afternoon. But if you have any information, you may give it to me. There's a reward. Is, is that about the steam launch, Aurora? I'm telling no one but Mr. Sherlock Holmes. No, no, no. Come, come inside. No. <laughs> I'm a police officer. You look like one. <laughs> no, you will be recompensed for your loss of time. You will not have long to wait. Sit down. Cigar, Mr. Jones. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I was saying, Doctor, I consider your friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, is a man not to be beat. He would have made a most promising police officer, I don't care who knows it, with a little more discipline and a lot less theory. Thank you. You might offer me one. <laughs> you rogue, you! You would have made an actor, and a rare one. You had the proper workhouse cop. And those weak legs of yours, they were ten pounds each. A police officer, I'm flattered. Jones, I shall need a police launch at the Westminster Steps. The fastest you have. Two stout men, yourself, myself, Watson, all of us armed. That is easily arranged. I will telephone the local station. We go to the tower. Stop opposite Jacobson's yard. How did you find the Aurora, then? Well, I reasoned that the launch couldn't be far off in spite of its invisibility. So, gentlemen, where could it be? Well, out of the water, I suppose. In a repair or boat builder's yard. Exactly. My boys is waiting by the yard to give us the signal. You planned it all very neatly, Mr. Holmes. But if the affair were in my hands, I should have a body of police in the yard and arrested them when they came down. Which would have been never. This man, Small, is a pretty shrewd fellow. Anything suspicious and he would lie snug for another week. Sir, we're opposite Jacobson's yard now. Shall we move downstream a little? No. This mist may be of advantage to us. We must lie low and wait. Go 
Your boy is signaling. I can see him plainly. There's the aurora. Going like the devil. She's very fast. I doubt if we shall catch her. We must catch her. Pile it on, Stokers. I'll never forgive myself if she proves to have the heels of us. Faster! Faster! This is the fastest boat they've got! Steady. I can almost make out his companion. the light more to the left.
Wait! Wait. Let him wear himself out. Jonathan Small. I'm sorry it has come to this. And so am I, sir. But I give you my word, gentlemen, I never laid hands on young Mr. Sholto. Of course you didn't. Your little friend's dart killed him while you were still climbing the rope. Well, you speak as if you were there, sir. Major Sholto, I would have swung for him with a light heart. But to be lagged over this young Sholto, it's cursed hard. Let's make a clean breast of it. If you do, I may be of use to you. Oh. <coughs> ah, quite a family party. I'm going to pull that flask myself. Now, how are you going, Small? Here's Meralda at Gravesend. Outward bound for the Brazils. I nearly made it. Another man at the engines and you'd never have caught us. Hey. Where's the key, my man? At the bottom of the river. Now, look here. We've had enough of you tonight, Small. Bring the cuffs in, men! I'm warning you! It's all right, Constable. We're nearly at the steps. I suggest that we go back to Baker Street, and I think Miss Morstan should be there. Well, that's not the regulation way, Mr. Holmes. Well, I can at least promise you a nice warming drink. Very well, gentlemen. <clears throat> well, Miss Morstan, I am pleased and proud to have been able to bring the thief to justice. Justice? A pretty justice. Whose loot is this if it is not ours? Where is the justice that I should give it up to those that have never earned it? You forget, Small, we know nothing of this matter. 
We cannot tell how far justice may have originally been on your side. Well, sir, you have been very fair spoken to me. Though I can see that it's you that I have to thank for these, these bracelets on my wrist. Still, I bear no grudge for that. If you want to hear my story, I have no wish to hold it back. And what I say to you is God's truth, every word of it. When I was a lad, I took the Queen's shilling and was posted out to India with the third buffs. The crocodile snapped this off when I was bathing in the Ganges. Well, the sawbones had my stump in the tar barrel nice and quick. I was young and strong. I got my discharge in this fellow. It's been a good support to me. So there I was, a cripple of 20. But I liked it out there. So I found myself a job as an overseer on an indigo farm. I was on horseback all day, so that was fine. But I was never in luck for long. Without a note of warning, the great mutiny was on us. I came back to the farm one evening to find my master and all his family had been murdered. <laughs> I didn't wait. By that same evening, I was in the ford of Agra, the nearest city still held by the British. Yeah, the old ford of Agra, it's a queer place, huge. It's full of passages and rooms. Uh, more entrances than you can count. There were many gates, and uh, because I was an ex-soldier and British, they put me in charge of one of them and gave me a couple of Sikhs who'd stayed loyal to us. It was a lonely place. My two Punjabis were experienced fighting men. Kata Singh and Indajit Singh. No, Sahib. The fort is safe. There are no rebels this side of the river. You must be with us, or you must be silenced forever. With you? How? We want you to be rich. Which is why you British came to this land. Well, I have no objection to being rich. Then swear by the bones of your father to raise no hand and to speak no word against us now or ever afterwards. Then you will have quarter of the treasure. But there are only three of us. Jagdeep Singh, my foster brother, he must have his share. There is no time, Sahib. Decide. Well, provided the fort is in no kind of danger, I swear. What would you have done, Mr. Holmes? I strongly suspect I'd have done exactly as you did. Yes, I know the Sikh. He's not a man to be trifled with. One of their local Rajas, Richard Creases, of course, he'd gone in with the rebels. But he wanted to hedge his bet, just in case the British came out on top. So he made a plot to get half his treasure hidden in the Ford of Agra. Sending one of his men with it in the guise of a merchant. And Jagodish Singh, Kartar's brother, to be the guide. They come challenge him, sir, in the usual way. 
Give him no cause for the fear. What then? We will do what has to be done. Who goes there? Oh, friend Sahib. Advance and be recognized. What have you with you? A, a bo box, I, old box, having some family papers. Uh, no good to nobody, Sahib, only for myself. The first. Sahib, I am no ordinary beggar. You will have money, Sahib. And Governor Sahib also. Take him to the main guard room. Never was a man more compassed round with death. had escaped, the whole affair would have come out. I should have been shot, most likely. Which of you would have held back his musket? Kata was for burning him. That's their religion. But such a fire was impossible. Jagodish was for throwing him down into the great ditch below the fort for the jackals to clean up. No doubt he was right. I was for showing some respect for the dead. Then we turned to the box. This box. Inside were more gems than I could ever even have dreamed of. <laughs> A hundred and forty-three diamonds of the first water, including the Great Mogul, the second largest stone in existence. Ninety-seven emeralds, one hundred and seventy rubies, forty carbuncles, sixty-one agates. Jagadish was right. It was a great mistake you made, burying the body as you did. Would you not say so, Watson? Yes, indeed. A body not burned in India is soon discovered. So, you and your three companions were found guilty and sent away for life to the penal colony on the Andaman Islands. Blair Island, it was, sir. Hope Town. Never was a place worse named. was a place to sweat, a place to rot, a place to die. And I sweated there year after year until your father arrived, Mr. Austin. Corporal! You will not maltreat the white prisoner. If it happens again, you'll be court-martialed. He was our administrative officer, and he gave me a nice, cushy billet in the dispensary. He was as good and kind a Christian gentleman as I ever come across. And I hold no grudge against him. Oh, you, miss.
Thank you, Mr. Small. Well, as I sat thinking about the treasure, I could see all the officers and the prison officials at their, their drinking and their gambling. Major Sholto never had much luck. Night after night, he was the loser. Some people are born like that. It's all up with me, Morton. I'm ruined. I shall have to send in my paper. I don't suppose you could manage another couple of hundred, eh? I've had a pretty nasty face of myself. And I've a daughter back home to support. And I've got two wretched sons. Ruined, eh? Damn pity. So? You decided to approach your benefactor, Captain Morstan. He was often in the dispensary. The tropical climate didn't agree with him. His heart was weak and his blood was all poisoned. Knowing that he would wish to share any arrangement with his friend, the officer in command, Major Shelter. Yes, sir. It seemed the safest way. It is your own private concern, over which, of course, you have the power of disposing as you think best. Thank you for that advice, sir. Thank you indeed. But the fact is, uh, being in the position I am, I need help. What sort of help? I need a partner. Well, I'm sure Major Shelter and myself would like to help you, if we could. We could at least talk about it. That is, of course, if we can agree as to terms. There's only one bargain a man in my position can make. In exchange for my freedom and that of my three companions, we shall give you a fifth share to divide between you. A fifth? That isn't very much. 50,000 at the least. Anyway, how can we possibly give you your freedom? You know, it's impossible. All we need is a boat and provisions. There are plenty of little yachts and yawls in Calcutta or Madras. Well enough to serve our purpose? If only they were just the one of you. None! None or all! We have sworn it. The four of us must always act together. Now. Calm yourself, Shorto. Calm, calm yourself. Calm yourself. Think about it, man. Think about it. Small is a man of his word. He will not abandon his friends. I think. I think we may very well trust him. We met the next morning in the small hours. I had our written agreement in every detail. We, being officers in the army of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, we, we being officers in the army of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, do swear on the Holy Bible that this agreement will always remain sacred and binding to us. To swear, swear on the Holy, Holy Bible, Bible that this, this agreement, agreement will always remain sacred and binding to us. I gave each of them a plan showing the position of the treasure. Well, look at that. Well, that brings back memories. Charter took an expert to India, found the treasure, and took it back with him to England. Yes. When we had the news, Captain Morstan was as angry as I was. He swore to me he would go home and settle the matter with Shalto. <laughs> and so he would, if he lived. But that was not to be. That day, I lived only for vengeance. I thought of it by day. I nursed it by night to get to Sholto, to have my hands on his throat. That was my one thought. As luck would have it, one of the islanders had been brought into my dispensary, more than half dead from a snake bite. Common humanity, I did my best for him. 
Somehow he pulled through and became very devoted to me. A funny little fellow. Well, you gentlemen caught a glimpse of him yourselves, no doubt, last night. He was staunch and true as little Tonga. No man ever had a more faithful mate. Being by trade a fisherman, he had a goodish-sized native boat, and he agreed to try to escape with me. After ten days, we were picked up by a trader with a cargo of pilgrims from Malay, bound for Jeddah. After many months, we worked our way across the world to London. A remarkable account. And now, I think Miss Morstan might like to see the great Agra treasure, which will surely make her one of the richest young ladies in England. Watson, there's no key. I'm sure our old poker will oblige. <laughs> this is your doing, Small. Yes. Yes, I put the treasure away where you shall never lay hand on it. No living man or woman has any right to it unless it is the three men in the Andaman convict barracks and myself. I know now that I cannot have the use of it. No more can they. But I have acted all along for them as much as for myself. It's been the sign of four with us always. Hmm. Where is it? It's where the key is. And where little Tonga is. I saw your launch must catch us, and I saw little Tonga go over the side. I put the loot in a safe place. You are deceiving us, Small. If you had wished to throw the treasure into the Thames, it would have been easier to have thrown box and all. Easier for me to throw and easier for you to recover. The man who is clever enough to hunt me down is clever enough to pick up a box from the bottom of the river. I am sorry. No, I'm glad the treasure is lost. It's been nothing but a curse to every man who has owned it. An early death to my poor father. And slavery for life to me and my companions. I spent the first half of my life digging a breakwater in the Andamans. And I'm likely to spend the other half digging ditches on Dartmoor. Well, Holmes, duty is duty, and I've gone rather far in bringing him here. I shall feel more at ease when I have our storyteller here under lock and key. I am obliged to you for your assistance. Good day to you, Dr. Watson, Miss Morstan. Ah, after you, Small. 
You seem a bit handy with that wooden leg of yours. most ashamed that you, Mr. Holmes, and you, dear Dr. Watson, have had to put yourselves into such peril on my behalf. Oh, that's all over and forgotten. Mrs. Forrester has sent her carriage for Miss Morstan. I'll impose on you no longer, gentlemen. You must be exhausted. Yes, I confess the reaction is already upon me. I should be as limp as a rag for a week. I'm so very grateful to you for clearing my father's name. I'm so very grateful to you both. Seems so unfair. You've done all the work in this business, and Athelney Jones gets all the credit. What remains for you? For me, the pleasure of having solved an interesting case, almost single-handed. And for you, no doubt, the pleasure of writing it up in your usual florid and romantic style. woman. Was she? I hadn't noticed. <laughs> 